To be stripped of one's vision is to be stripped of one's ambition. As he was sent to the sea, though he fights back desperately against his predicament, it does nothing to prevent his descent from the depths. Or so they say. But is that always the fact? Is it the true reality for us all? Are our fates already predetermined the moment we were born? To the four, the ill, the unfortunate, and the disabled have no chance in ever achieving their desired life just because they bear burdens that is too much for them to carry. Does light even shine in the darkest side of the world? That is a question we may or may not answer at the end of this podcast. But before that, let me introduce myself. A good day to you all listeners out there tuning into the show. My name is Giancarlo Magustin, and I am very excited because this is the first ever podcast I've ever hosted, and it feels so surreal right now, and I'm enjoying every moment, and I hope you will too. So, how are my listeners feeling right now? Are you doing fine? Or are you somehow feeling stuck in a rut? To those people who are doing good and feeling alright right now, cherish every moment and keep up your positive vibe and share happiness with all those around you. Cause even a simple smile from a happy person can melt the heart of those who are feeling buried down. To those who are currently facing some issues, problems, feeling stress or anything or any negative emotions. Let me inspire you with a story about Helen Keller, an American educator who overcame the adversity of being blind and deaf to become one of the 20th century's leading humanitarians, as well as co-founder of many organizations. Helen Keller was born on June 27, 1880 in Tuscombe, Alabama. Keller was the first of two daughters, born to Arthur H. Keller and Catherine Adams Keller. Helen Keller's father had served as an officer in the Confederate Army during the Civil War, and she also had two older stepbrothers. The family was not particularly wealthy and earned income from their cotton plantation. Later, Arthur became the editor of a weekly local newspaper, The North Alabamian. Helen Keller was born with her senses of sight and hearing, and she started speaking when she was just six months old, and she started walking at the age of one. Helen Keller lost both her sight and hearing when she was just 19 months old in 1882. She contracted an illness called brain fever by the family doctor, and that produced a high body temperature. The true nature of the illness remains a mystery today, though some experts believe it might have been scarlet fever or meningitis. Within a few days after the the paper broke, Keller's mother noticed that her daughter didn't show any reaction when a dinner bell was rung or when a hand was waved in front of her face. As Keller grew into childhood, she developed a limited method of communication with her companion, Martha Washington, the young daughter of the family cook. The two had created a type of sign language. By the time Keller was seven, they had invented more than six designs to communicate with each other. During this time, Keller had also become very wild and unruly. She would kick and scream when angry and giggle uncontrollably when happy. She tormented Martha and inflicted raging tantrums on her parents. Many family relatives felt that she should be sent to an institution. Looking for answers and inspirations, Helen Keller's mother came across a travelogue by Charles Dickens titled American Notes in 1886. 
picture out of the successful education of another deaf and blind child named Lara Bridgman. And soon dispatched Keller and her father to Baltimore, Maryland to see the specialist, Dr. J. Chilean Chisholm. After examining Keller, Chisholm recommended that Helen Keller should see Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, who was currently working with deaf children at the time. Bell met with Keller and her parents and suggested that they travel to the Frickens Institute for the, blind, for the Blind in Boston, Massachusetts. There, the family met with the school's director, Michael Anaganos. He suggested Keller to work with one of the Institute's most recent graduates, Ann Sullivan. On March 3, 1887, Ann went to Keller's home in Alabama and she immediately went to work. She began by teaching six-year-old Helen finger spelling, starting with the word doll, to help Keller understand the gift of a doll she had brought along. Other words would follow. At first, Keller was curious. Then she became defiant, refusing to cooperate with Sullivan's instruction. When Keller did cooperate, Anne Sullivan could tell that she wasn't making the connection between the objects and the letters spelled out in her hands. Sullivan kept working at it, forcing Keller to go through the regimen. As Helen Keller's frustration grew, the tantrums increased. Finally, Anne Sullivan demanded that she and Keller be isolated from the rest of the family for a short amount of time so that Keller could only concentrate on Sullivan's instruction. They then moved to a cottage on the plantation. In a dramatic struggle, Sullivan taught Keller the word water. She helped her make the connection between the object and the letters by taking Keller out to the water well and placing Keller's hand under the water's felt. While Sullivan moved the lever to flush cool water over Keller's hand, she spelled out the word W-A-T-E-R on Keller's other hand. Helen Keller then understood and repeated the word in Sullivan's hand. She then pounded the ground, demanding to know its letter name. Sullivan followed her, spelling out the word into her hand. Keller moved to the other objects with Sullivan in tow. By nightfall, she already had learned 30 words. In 1905, Anne Sullivan married John Macy, an instructor at Harvard's University, a social critic, and a prominent socialist. After the marriage, Anne Sullivan continued to be Hunter's guide and mentor. When Keller went to live with the Macy's, they both initially gave Keller their undivided attention. Gradually, however, Anne and John became distant to each other, as Anne's devotion to Keller continued unabated. After several years, the couple separated, though they were never divorced. In 1890, Helen Keller began speech classes at the Horatio Mann School for the Deaf in Boston. She would toil for 25 years to learn to speak so that others could understand her. From 1894 to 1896, Keller attended the Wright Human Son School for the Deaf in New York City. There, she worked on improving her communication skills and studied regular academic subjects. Around this time, Helen Keller became determined to attend college. In 1896, she attended the Cambridge School for Young Ladies, a preparatory school for women. As her story became known to the general public, Keller began to meet a famous and influential people. 
One of them was the writer Mark Twain, who was very impressed with her. They became friends. Twain introduced her to his friend Henry Rogers, a Standard Oil executive. Rogers was so impressed with Keller's talent, drive, and determination that he agreed to pay for her to attend Radcliffe College. There, she was accompanied by Anne Sullivan, who sat by her side to interpret lectures and texts. By this time, Helen Keller had already mastered several methods of communication, including touch lip reading, braille, speech, typing, and finger spelling. Kellen then graduated cum laude from Radcliffe College in 1904 at the age of 24. With the help of Anne Sullivan and John Macy, Helen Keller wrote her first book, The Story of My Life. It was published in 1905. The memoir covered Keller's, Helen Keller's transformation from childhood to a 21-year-old college student. Keller worked with her teacher Anne Sullivan for years, from 1887 until Anne Sullivan's death in 1936. Throughout the first half of the 20th century, Keller tackled social and political issues, including women's suffrage, pacifism, birth control, and socialism. After college, Keller set out to learn more about the world and how she could help improve the lives of others. News of her story spread beyond Massachusetts and New England. Helen Keller became a well-known celebrity and lecturer by sharing her experiences with many audiences and working on behalf of others living with disabilities. She testified before the Congress, strongly advocating to improve the welfare for the blind people. In 1915, along with her note city planner, George Kiesler, she co-founded Helen Keller International, or the HKI, to combat the causes and consequences of blindness and malnutrition. In 1920, she helped found the American Civil Liberties Union, or the ACLU. When the American Federation, Port of Line was first established in 1921, Keller had an effective national outlet for her efforts. She became a member in 1924 and participated in many campaigns to raise awareness, money, and support for the blind. She also joined other organizations dedicated to helping those less fortunate, including the Permanent Blind War Relief Fund, later called the American Braille Press. Soon after she graduated from college, Keller became a member of the Socialist Party. Most likely, joined part to her friendship with Jan Macy. Between 1909 and 1921, she wrote several articles about socialism and supported Eugene Debs, a Socialist Party presidential candidate. Her series of essays on socialism, entitled Out of the Dark, described her views on socialism and world affairs. It was during this time that Keller first experienced public child prejudice due to her disabilities. For most of her life, the press had been overwhelmingly supportive of her, praising her courage and intelligence. But after she expressed her socialist views, some criticized her by calling attention to her disabilities. One newspaper, the Brooklyn Eagle, wrote that her mistakes sprung out from the manifest limitations of her development. In 1932, Anne Sullivan experienced health problems and 
lost her eyesight completely. A young woman named Polly Thompson, who had begun working as a secretary for Keller and Sullivan in 1914, became Keller's consultant companion upon Anne Sullivan's death. In 1946, Keller was appointed counselor of international relations for the American Foundation of Overseas Blind. Between 1946 and 1957, she traveled to 35 countries on five continents. In 1955, at age 75, Keller embarked on the longest and most grueling trip of her life, a 40,000-mile, five-month trek across Asia. Through her many speeches and appearance, she brought inspiration and encouragement to millions of people. Helen Keller suffered a series of strokes in 1961 and spent the remaining years of her life at her home in Connecticut. On June 1, 1968, Helen Keller died in her sleep at her home, Arkan Ridge, a few weeks short of her 88th birthday. A service was held in her honor at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., and after her cremation, her ashes were then placed next to her companion, Anne Sullivan. And that was the story of Helen Keller, where despite all the odds of the world against her favor, she did not stop, but try her best to become a successful and renowned person she is now. It's so inspiring to see that, even though she went blind and deaf at the same time, she did not lose hope. With the help of the kind-hearted people around her, she was able to reach the pinnacle where not many has reached. I myself am inspired to the fullest due to how remarkable she is. During her life, Keller stood out as a powerful example of how determination, hard work, and imagination can allow an individual to triumph over adversity. By overcoming difficult conditions with a great deal of persistence, she grew into a respected and world-renowned activists who labored for the betterment of others. Helen Carter's long-lasting impact can be felt in the legacy of works she published, the speeches she made, and the organizations she founded. Keller was a role model and proved the world that deaf people are able to communicate just like everyone else, and showed people that they are just as capable as given with the right tools to do so.